as you know, we've been discussing the fact that it's so important to press into God, to listen to Him, to seek His His face, not His hands, not just what He can do for you, but His face, having that relationship with Him. That is so important. We've studied this uh, for, for several weeks on our, our series in the School of the Spirit. And so I want you to know that that our foundation scripture should now be implanted in your heart and mind so that you can make this a reality in your life. And it's found in Romans 8, 14. And it says, for as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And that's my prayer for you. That's my, my goal. That's my desire is that you as a son of God, as a daughter of God will be led by the spirit of God. You will be following his plan for your life, not your own plan or not somebody else's plan for your life, especially not be led by your flesh. This is what we've camped on for for several weeks about how important it is for you to say down flesh. You not, not to let your flesh rise up and try to control you. Because when we're led by the Holy Spirit, then the outcome is good. When we're led by the flesh, according to the Bible, it leads to death. And so what we want to do is we want to be led by the Spirit of God. We want to follow what the Word of God says so that we will have the, the confidence and the power and the ability to say down flesh because we'll recognize mm, that wasn't a God thought that was a flesh thought that was my own thought see we have to grow up in the things of God we have to grow up because God wants us to be victorious he wants us to have a, an overcoming life he's got a good plan Jeremiah 29 11 he's got a good plan for your life and his plan leads to life and life more abundantly the enemy's plan our own plan sometimes leads to to death when we when we don't line our own plan up with God's plan do you understand that's the goal that's the goal that you and God be together on this plan for your life. And so when you're following God's plan, you won't be susceptible like we talked about. You won't be yielding to temptation because temptations are gonna come. They're gonna come to everybody, but it's whether we yield to that temptation. Remember Jesus told his disciples, don't yield don't yield, pray. So you do not get into temptation. If you're having a temptation that you're having trouble overcoming, then what do you do? You pray, you pray in the Holy Ghost. See, the Bible has an answer book for every kind of issue, every kind of thought, every kind of habit that you've had that you know it does not line up with what godliness is. And so you need to, to get in the word and, and pray and seek his face and, and stand on the word and make confessions of the word of God that you have control over your flesh. You know, I remember when we got married, Pastor Dean and I, we just made a decision. We're going to throw out all the alcohol. So we dumped it all out. We dumped it in the sink. But, you know, there was another issue that he had, and that was cigarettes that, you know, wasn't as easy to to throw out the window. I mean, he did that many times. He threw, threw out the pack um, out the window and then he would drive around the block and, and try to find it, but it was already run over, so it was flat. He had to go buy another, another, um, pack of cigarettes but you know I would find I would be gardening out in my roses and find cigarette butts you know and so it was it was not good for me to try to be the Holy Spirit <laughs> that's important wives husbands you don't try to be your spouse's Holy Spirit you know because it doesn't work and so you know when you smoke if you're around somebody who smokes you can smell it I mean <laughs> there you can't hide that you can't hide that. We went to on a trip to California one time with a couple and and for some reason he didn't think we knew he smoked. And so we would be sitting at dinner table and he would get up like every five minutes, like who has to go to the bathroom that often? And so <laughs> So he would come back to the table and what he thought is if he sprayed enough of, of that cologne, we wouldn't be able to tell. Well, every time he came back to the table, it was like, oh my gosh, this, this cologne is so strong. But you know, 
Pastor Dean would, would, would smoke and he was, he was battling with this, controlling his flesh. And so we would talk about it because I would, you know, find out that he did, you know, here's the cigarette butts in the, in the garden. And he said, he said, but I love to smoke. Can I just smoke a pipe? Can I just smoke something, you know? I said, no, the reason you have not quit smoking is because of your confession. I love to smoke. <laughs> okay, you're gonna love to smoke. <laughs> you can have what you say, right? That's what the word of God says. So, so finally he changed his confession to I hate to smoke, I hate to smoke. It's not good for my body, it's not good for my lungs, it's not good for my arteries whatever, he began to change his confession even though he was still smoking. And guess what? He quit smoking. Got up one day, no desire, no desire. See, God has in his word the answer. God had the answer, but he wasn't appropriating the answer. Do you understand? He wasn't changing his confession. He was confessing contrary to what he was believing. That's why it's so important for you to speak words of life. You to speak words of life over your body, over your friends, over every situation. And it's going to come to pass because God wants you to live an overcoming life. But see, what you have to do is what Deuteronomy 30, 19 says. You have to choose. You have to choose life. You can choose death or you can choose life. So you have to understand that it's a process. It's a process um, that, that we go through as we learn the word, apply the word, learn the word, apply the word, learn the word, apply the word. None of us have maxed out on the word. Do you understand? I believe we'll be learning till we see Jesus face to face. And maybe even after that, I don't know in heaven what we're going to do. But I do know that for the now, for the nasty now, we all need to be about the Father's business. We all need to be in process, growing, growing, going from faith to faith, victory to victory. And it doesn't matter if it's just a little victory, it's still a victory, do you understand? If you've overcome this area of your flesh, then that's good, praise the Lord. If you haven't, then repent and start over again. Do you understand? Like keep on keeping on, do not quit. That's what we have to do. So. We've, we've previously talked about, about how important it is to study the New Testament letters because Paul and other authors of those letters kind of told us what to do with our flesh. You know, that's what's so gracious about God. He tells us to do something, but he provides a way that we can do it. He equips us to have the overcoming victorious life that, he, that Jesus bled out for us to have. And so we've studied about how important it is to, in fact, <laughs> overcome the flesh. That, that's in so many of the letters that Paul wrote. He wrote about it in Ephesians. He, he told us what to put off and then what to put on. And then we talked about Galatians with the, the works of the flesh and as opposed to the fruit that you're supposed to produce in your life. And so then we went on to Hebrews where he wrote that we're to lay apart certain things. We talked about this last time. You know, it was just like he kept hammering and hammering and hammering. Look, you can't live like this. There's got to be some adjustments in your life. And you have to go back and look at the, the world during Jesus' time. It was like the world here. <laughs> pretty bad, pretty bad. There was a lot of sin. There was a lot of, of, of fornication, adultery. You know, even it, at Ephesus, they would go, they had the public baths. I have pictures of the public baths where the men would go uh, one day and the women would go another day. I wonder if they changed the water. I don't know how they did it. They didn't have chlorine back then. But anyway, so, so you know, there was a lot of homosexuality because of the, the public baths and then the people would go to, to worship their idols um, and, you know, have sex at church. <laughs> so, so he's trying to change their thinking because if he changes their thinking to conform with what God wants, it will change their behavior. So it's no different than today. <laughs> We've got the same distractions. We've got the same, same things that we're having to deal with. But I'm telling you, we can do this if you determine, if you choose to train yourself to godliness. It's a choice that you have to make. 
Nobody can make that, that choice for, for you. You know, he, he went on to say in, in Hebrews that if you live worldly, that this is worldly filthiness. In fact, that's what the, the scripture means. Um, superfluity of naughtiness is the, the King James, but what it means is you stink. You stink. If you live like this, if you live contrary to the word of God, you are a putrid mess. That's the literal Greek translation. So I think they should have put that in the King James. I think it gives a better word picture, but we don't want to be a a putrid mess. We don't want to stink in the nostrils of God. So then we studied how James, Pastor James, pastor of the church at, at Jerusalem, told us to lay aside certain things. See the theme flowing through the letters is okay. Okay, now you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. So there's some things that you have to do to be conformed to the image of, of Jesus. So this is what you need to do. And, and of course, all of them say, bottom line, don't do that. I'm telling you what not to do. I'm telling you to be led by the Spirit of God. Allow Him to, to lead you and guide you, not your flesh and then be a doer of what he tells you to do. In other words, be obedient. This is why it's so important as as young men and women, as children, to start being obedient to our parents and the people over you because that will progress. If you're not obedient to your parents, as a child, then guess what? You're not gonna be obedient to God. If you're not obedient to your parents and and, and this process as you grow up, guess what? You're not gonna be obedient to your boss at work. You're just gonna do, wanna do your own thing. You're gonna be in rebellion. And see, that's all contrary to the word of God. God gave you parents to, to treat, teach you and train you as a small individual so that when you grow up, you will transfer that obedience from your parents to God. Do you understand? It's so important. Obedience is so important because the opposite of that is what? Rebellion. <laughs> I don't want to do that. My flesh doesn't want to do that. Well, that's rebellion. And the Bible says that's as the sin of witchcraft. So you're following the devil. So we don't want to do that. So then um, as we were reading in our PFS, Peter is telling us basically the same thing. In Peter, 1 Peter one, I mean, First Peter and Second Peter, he talks about these things. So if you see the thread that is through the letters, look, get your act together. <laughs> That's how I would say it. So Peter is talking to all the churches and in First Peter two, one through two, he says, wherefore laying aside, mm, there it is again, lay it aside. What does laying aside mean? We talked about this. It means putting it so far from you that you don't reach it and you don't bring it back into your life. Do you understand? So we gotta lay these things aside. We gotta make a decision to do this. And it says, lay aside malice, envyings, and all evil speakings as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. See, these, these, these requirements or these suggestions that you need to hold on to, they're to help you grow, to grow up. And so you're not a baby anymore in the things of God. You're a mature Christian. And we'll, like I said, we'll be growing till Jesus parts the clouds, but we want to grow. We want to take baby steps, steps, just like it says, desire the sincere milk of the word. And in verse 11 and 12, he says, some additional guidelines that we're to do. Dearly beloved, I beseech you. And remember what beseech means. It means I plead with you, I beg you. In other words, when you see that word beseech, like we don't use that today, I beseech you to please go, you know. We don't use that word today, but, but think about it. He's begging them, he's pleading with them. He says, as strangers and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lust, abstain. You abstain from fleshly lust. That's what we've been talking about. We've listed all the fleshly lusts, or not all of them, but a lot of them that you can be involved in. But look what it says. It says, 
they war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. So what this is saying is that your flesh wars against your mind, your will, and your emotions. And this means in the actual Greek, it means an unending continual assault. So your flesh, until you get it under control, you have this unending continual assault on your mind and your emotions. So listen to this, your flesh is never content until it has completely taken you over and consumed you. Yeah, that's what your flesh wants to do. But, but, but we, as big boy and big girl Christians, we don't have to give the flesh permission. Do you understand? We don't give our flesh permission to have its way in our life. So when we do this, when we control our flesh, then we keep our soul free from all these battles. Do you understand? So we have learned to remove, put away, and permanently remove things from our life. And it talks about guile, which we don't use that word much anymore, but that means trickery and manipulation. Guile means trickery and manipulation. Hypocrisies, which means pretense, envy, and of course, we've talked about envy and evil speaking before. So the message makes it a little clear. And I want you to listen to this. It says, so clean house. Some of us need to clean house. So clean house, make a clean sweep of malice and pretense, envy and hurtful talk. Get rid of hurtful talk. You know, some things we say that we don't think anything of it, but it's really hurt the person that you said it to. So we need to get rid of hurtful talk. It goes on to say, you had a taste of God. Now like infants at the breast, drink deep of God's pure kindness. Then you will grow up and mature and be whole in God. Be kind. Be kind. Ephesians 4.32, remember that? Be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Verse 11 says in the Passion, my divinely loved friends, since you are resident aliens and foreigners in this world. Think about that, we talked about that. This is not our home. We are resident aliens and foreigners in the world. I appeal to you to divorce yourselves from the evil desires that wage war within you. Live honorable lives. Now in the message, verse 11 says, friends, this world is not your home. Aren't we glad? <laughs> this world is not your home, so don't make yourselves cozy. So don't make yourselves cozy in it. Don't indulge your ego at the expense of your soul. Live an exemplary life in your neighborhood so that your actions will refute their prejudices. In other words, be the light. That's what we're talking about today, salt and light. And Peter doesn't stop here in chapter four, one through four, he gives further instruction. I would encourage you to read just the whole book of Peter, first Peter and second Peter. But it says in the message, since Jesus went through everything you're going through and more, so don't feel like, oh, pity party. Nobody's, nobody's done this. Nobody's been tempted like this. Nobody's gone through what I'm going through. Read the word. Since Jesus went through everything you're going through and more, learn to think like him, right? Battlefield is the mind. Think of your sufferings as a weaning from that old sinful habit of expecting to get your own way. Then you'll be able to live out your days free to pursue what God wants instead of being tyrannized by what you want. 
See, that's subduing the flesh. That's saying what Jesus said, you know, not my will, but your will be done. That should be your profession every single day. Get up, God, lead me and guide me. I'm gonna follow you, Spirit of God, speak through me. Not my will, but your will be done. Show me, help me, help me to live the life. Help me to overcome this habit or this this carnal attitude that I have. And he will help you, he will help you. Then it goes on to say, you've already put in your time in that God ignorant way of life, partying night after night, a drunken and profligate life. Now it's time to be done with it for good. Of course, your old friends don't understand why you don't join in the old gang anymore, but you don't have to give an account to them. Do you understand? You don't have to give an account to any of these friends. They're the ones who will be called on the carpet and before God himself. Then Peter has a final call to believers in verse seven. In the Passion it says, since we are approaching the end of all things. And that is true, (laughs) so true. In this day and this hour, we're about to the end. But it tells you what to do. It says, be intentional. Be intentional, purposeful, and self-controlled so that you can be given to prayer. That's a choice you have to make. And I, I pray everybody who's here, everybody who's watching will make that choice to be intentional because the days are short. Now, I've given you a handout and the title of it is You Choose because we, we're culminating all the things that we were told to do in Peter, in Hebrews, in Ephesians and Galatians, all the specifics that, that we have studied. And so I wanted it to be on a paper, a handout so you can look at these things and you can contrast between the characteristics of a spirit-filled life led by the spirit, God's way, and a life of the flesh. Do you understand? So you can see it right in front of you and see the difference. Now I put at the top Deuteronomy 30, 19 because it is your choice and I pray you choose life. That's what the scripture says, you choose life. And then Galatians 6, 7, and 8 talks about, you know, you reap what you sow, you sow to the flesh, you sow to the right side, you're gonna reap from the right side. So we wanna sow to the left, which is sow to the word and so to the spirit. So I've entitled the left column, life in the spirit, God's way, and underneath word trained. This is our goal. Every time we come to church, we're receiving training, training in the word of God. But you have to do something with the things you hear. You know, we've talked about Joshua 1.8, you have to take it. You have to review your notes. You have to meditate on it. You have to study the word of God so you can be trained. Then on the right side, life in the flesh or the world's way. And and know that the world is trying to suck you down, trying to suck you in. If you say you're a Christian, you're, you're born again, you have the light of Jesus on the inside of you, then you got a target on your back. The world and the enemy wants to pull you down, to get you back in the world. And so then underneath that, I put world, world trained. We've been world trained, but we wanna be word trained. Okay, so our attitude as as a spirit led person is to be obedient, right? It's to be faithful. It's to be loyal, devoted, dedicated. It's to be available to God, sold out to God, consecrated to God, to live a holy life, have a holy attitude. Whereas if, if you're in the world and you're, you're practicing in the world things and you're not determined to have the attitude of, of God and His Word, you're gonna be lazy. Lazy Christians don't please the Father. Lascivious, I like that word. That's why I put it on here again. Means no restraint of the flesh. Carnal, carnal, what is carnal? Pointless endeavors that you indulge in that bring no life to your life like video games, 
fake book. You know, spend a lot of time on stuff that is not, not producing anything in your life, even television. When I was growing up, we didn't have all these other things, but we did have TV. You spend hours and hours and hours on the television. What is that doing to you? Nothing. Is that making your life better? No, no, not at all. Then the attitude of the world's way is deceitful. That's the main avenue that the enemy is using today. He's trying to deceive us. Uh, dominated by S, S-E-L-F, dominated by self. Disobedient, rebellious. The characteristics, and you can read through all these characteristics because when you read them together, like the characteristics of God's way, the word trained, they minister life and peace. Like when you just read them, I would suggest you read them out loud. But when you read the other side, you know, it's like, yuck, gag a maggot. You don't wanna be that way. And if there's any of the, these that you have a propensity that's a leaning toward to be, then make some adjustments. And that's why I put at the bottom, the answer that we've discussed over these past weeks. To walk and live in the spirit. You get in the word. I've given you scriptures. There's a lot more scriptures that, that I could give you, but I would encourage you to mark these in your Bible. You pray, pray in the Holy Ghost. Control your thoughts. Yield to God and practice godliness. These are so, so very important. So keep that handout handy. You know, check yourself periodically. You know, go back over these things and, and in a couple of months, you know, have you slipped? Have you gone back? See, see, that's why, that's why we can't let the things of God slip. You know, we hear a message and, and we begin to do certain things and, oh, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. And then you do that for a week and then you go back. Don't let these things slip. Don't quit pursuing God and put this in a place where you, you know, highlight the ones you have issues with and, and ask the Holy Spirit every day, help me not to be lazy. Help me to not have that attitude of, it's all about me. I'm, uh, it's me, me, me. You know, I'm all that in a bag of Doritos. I'm, I'm the greatest thing since peanut butter that came on this earth. No, you're not. You're not. I hate to burst your bubble, but you're not. Um, but you know, just like, just like, we're living in a society that Peter even said, we're surrounded by sin. We, we're no different really than the church at Ephesus. Just because we don't have the bathhouses and we don't have sex at church, it's still just as bad <laughs> or even worse today because we've got your little telephone with all the internet and all the things that, that are available to you. But we have to constantly resist, listen to me, we have to constantly resist the lure of sin. And we've got to do what believers are called to do. Learn to live among those in the world without being like them. You've got to learn to do that. Because there are people in the world that are not like you, that aren't godly. And you've got to learn to live with them and to be the light. That's what we're talking about today. So you've got to focus on God every single day. You've got to watch what goes into your ear gates. Watch what goes into your eye gates. Watch what comes out of your mouth. Watch what goes into your heart. That's why we give you Bible reading schedules. So you've got to put off. You've got to abstain from. You've got to lay apart. You've got to get rid of worldliness and then put on godliness. Why do we, why do we want to do this? So we can change our world. So we can change our world. See, that's what Jesus said right before he parted the clouds and went up. He said, Matthew 28, 19 through 20, Mark 16, 15 through 18. He said, you go into your world. This is your assignment. I'm out of here. I'm going to heaven. I'm sitting at the right hand of the father, but you got an assignment and this is your assignment. And so are we going to be doers or forgetful hearers? We want to do what he told us to do. Go into our world and minister the good news of the gospel. Now, we're going to go to uh, the Sermon on the Mount today. We're going to talk about the fact that you are the salt, you're the light, you're a city set up on the hill. And so uh, in, in um, 
Matthew 5, 13 through 14, Jesus is speaking. And I would encourage you to, um, to go ahead and, and read these five, six, and seven long kind of uh, chapters in Matthew where Jesus was just sitting teaching the people. He was teaching the people. If you have a red letter edition, it's red. But, but see, he was telling them as true believers, you have a responsibility. And, and this is a really famous sermon, but, but Jesus is saying, look, basically, you're gonna be the salt, you're gonna be the light, you're like a city set up on the hill. Basically, what presence do you bring? What presence do you bring? When you walk into a room, when you leave a conversation, have you left the scent of Jesus or have you left the scent of bad gas? You know, cause you talked carnality or you, you told dirty jokes, you, you know, you, we're not gonna go there but you, you get the picture. Do you understand? What scent do you bring? What presence do you bring? We wanna bring the presence of Jesus. So let's read it. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, or King James says savor, which means the same thing, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. So we're gonna unpack the scriptures with the literal meaning of it and, and even some natural meanings. The first one is salt in the Greek describes salt. <laughs> It's, it means salt. Salt is salt. It means the salt you use on your, your french fries or your, or your um, chips and salsa. You know, those chips, they don't taste the same without a little salt. But I want you to know that in Jesus' day, that salt could only be found in a few places. And it was around the Dead Sea. If you drive to El Paso, you see the salt flats. There are only particular locations of salt. And so it was a very expensive process during that time to get the salt out. And so it was valuable. And so even many of the Roman soldiers were paid in salt. That was their salary. In fact, they called it salarium, salarium. That was, that was their paycheck, that was their salary. And of course, we've later, uh, the English word became salary. And so this was an expensive process, but, but because they needed the salt, because in Israel, very warm temperatures, so the meat would spoil. And so they used the salt as a preservative on the meat so it wouldn't, wouldn't spoil. And Jesus is the salt, right? So he sustains life. Jesus sustains life. He preserves life and he's faithful to his promise. And even today, it's crucial in maintaining good health for you to have some salt. Not too much salt, but it helps with your blood pressure. It helps with your muscles. It helps with the fluid inside. It helps with your nerves. So your body is, is, is required to have some sort of salt. But so when he, he, when he was talking about this, you're the salt of the earth, the people listening to Jesus, they on that hillside, they knew that what he meant, that, that we're to be a preservative. We're to preserve our world, do you understand? Because our world is filled with rot and decay. Just like the meat would rot and decay if it didn't have that salt placed on it. So what he's, he's telling us basically is that you and I as the salt of the earth, and he said, you are the salt of the earth, right? We're holding back the forces of corruption. You know, as long as the church is here, God, godliness, godlessness rather, and rebellion, it will not be able to, to culminate in its fulfillment. As soon as we're taken out, that's when godlessness and evil and rebellion will take over. So our very presence individually and as a church 
really abates or holds back the corruption. And we see the corruption eating away at the world today. But we have a responsibility, church. We have a responsibility individually and collectively to be the salt of the earth. Salt is also a flavor enhancer. I just talked about that, chips. Like you get the chips here, they need to have that little bit of salt. It's really good. Those French fries need a little bit of salt. So we are to be the flavor enhancers. And so they knew that, the people listening on the hillside. Um, we are to bring the flavor of Jesus everywhere we go. Not the flavor of me, me, me. And what about me? Also, in ancient times, the salt was used as an antiseptic, as an antiseptic, a disinfectant. So they used heavy doses to sanitize, to clean, and to make an area germ-free. So if there was a rapidly spreading disease in an area, the sick people were relocated and then salt was immediately spread over that entire area so it could sanitize it, it could disinfect it. And they even used it in the barns, in the barnyards where the animals were. If there was a disease among the animals, they would spread out the salt. So Jesus was telling those people who knew all these things that you are the spiritual antiseptic. Do you understand? You're the spiritual antiseptic to the world because the world is what? Diseased in sin. The world is diseased in sin. So you need to ask yourself, is your life produ producing evidence? Is your presence making a difference? Are you helping to preserve a spiritually sanitized environment? Salt was also used as a healing agent. It was poured into a wound to sanitize and stop the spread of infection and to stop bleeding and speed up the healing process. If you've ever had a canker sore in your mouth, if you will endure and put salt on it, which it burns really, really bad, it will heal faster. So we, we as believers are to carry the salt the healing power of God to a lost and a dying world by ministering to the sick, right? And by preaching the word because the word is medicine. That's right. Now, salt was also used in, in pagan rituals to drive away evil spirits. So I think, thought that was interesting. And they would put salt on the thresholds of their homes and businesses to keep the evil spirits out. So when Jesus said salt of the earth, they understood that, that they, you and I, are a source of spiritual protection. Do you understand? We're safety to people who are assaulted by demons. And, and God has given us everything we need as the salt. He's given us the blood, right? He's given us the name. He's given our testimony. Everything we need to, to bring safety, to bring protection and deliverance to a lost and a dying world. You see the correlation between salt. He uses something natural, which is what Jesus always did, so that the people could understand it to bring about a spiritual truth. And then he says, if the salt loses its flavor or savor, it's good for nothing to be, but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. I don't want to be good for nothing. Do you? I don't want to lose my savor. See, this is what's going to happen if the church is not doing its job. It loses its savor. Farmers also use uh, salt as a fertilizer to produce better crops. So your world is to be positively impacted because you're in it. Do you understand? Because you carry the life of God. You are carriers of the presence of God. Colossians 4, 6 says that your conversation should be seasoned with salt. What does that mean? 
Your conversation should be not not full of complaints, criticism, negativity, filth, filthy, filthy, ugly words, but you should have a positive influence. See, you have to train yourself that you're going to impact your world each and every day. And your world could be just your family. It could be that little brother or sister. It could be your classmates. It could be the people that you work with. It could be whoever, your neighbor. You have to make a decision. I am the salt of the earth. I'm gonna preserve, I'm gonna disinfect, I'm going to spread the good news of the gospel to a lost, sick, dying world because they need healing. They need the gospel of Jesus Christ. They need the good news. So your conversation, according to this, should be filled with faith-filled words. See, what if you choose not to be the salt? It says, if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is in good for nothing to be thrown out and trampled underfoot, listen, by men, underfoot by men. If your, if your presence doesn't do any of these things that we just talked about, then you're not holding back the forces of darkness, the forces of corruption that are here. We need to be doing these things so we can preserve our world. And then we don't want to be trampled underfoot. When it says clearly, if we lose our flavor, if we lose our savor, we'll be trampled underfoot. And I'm telling you, that's the agenda in the world today, to trample the church underfoot. And many in the church, individual and universal, are saltless. They've lost their savor, going by what the world says rather than what the Word says. You have to determine determine, I'm never gonna lose my savor. I'm never gonna lose my flavor. Let me tell you a story about someone who lost his savor. And this is so important because Genesis 18 tells the account of how, how the Lord stopped, we know it, the Lord stopped to talk to Abraham and he was on his way to Sodom. He was on his way to Sodom. And so he wanted to talk to, to Abraham about the impending doom of Sodom and Gomorrah, both of them. And so we know in reading the story how, how, um, how Abraham bargained with God. You can read the story. You know, he finally got down to 18. Abraham said, if there's 18, if there's 18 righteous men, will you not destroy Sodom? Now, in my mind, I'm thinking that, that Abraham was thinking, okay, his, his nephew Salt and the law was living there in, in uh, Sodom. And so at least there are 10 righteous. At least Lot has done his job to spread the salt <laughs> of Jesus. However, he lost his savor. We know the story and he failed God. You see, he had walked with Abraham, right? He had been taught by Abraham because they didn't have Bibles. They didn't have CD players. They didn't have uh, DVDs. They didn't have YouTube. So, you know, in those days, the, the father or the elder would sit down and discuss all the things that God had done. And so Lot had heard these revelations and you can hear revelations, but not do what you know to do, do you understand? And Lot is a good example. Lot is a very good example. And, and that's so sad because what did he do? We know from reading the scripture that he, he pitched his tent towards Sodom, clearly. So he kept his eyes focused on the world. He could see because he came out of his tent, he could see Sodom, he could see the world, he could see people in there who were very, very ungodly, much like the world today. But he pitched his tent, he kept his eyes on things. That's why you have to watch what goes in your eye gates and your ear gates, do you understand? And so, Pretty soon we find out that he wasn't just living outside of Sodom, he had moved into Sodom. Do you understand? 
And so he might have moved in there. He was a righteous man. God saved him, right? He was one of the righteous. And he moved in to, to Sodom, but yet he took his whole family into Sodom. Ungodly place, ungodly place. So what happened? See, he was drawn into the world. He saw the glitz and glamor of Sodom and he thought, I need to have that. I need to participate. If not participate, I need to be, be there where that excitement is. So he thought, okay, Sodom has something to offer his family. Now think about it. Think about it, all you daddies. Who took the family into Sodom? I did. Daddy took the whole family into Sodom. He took them in, but he couldn't get them out. He only escaped with two of his daughters and a wife who looked back because she was lusting after the things of Sodom. She liked living in Sodom, but she was righteous, but she was kind of a carnal Christian, right? <laughs> one foot in the world and one foot in the word. So, you know, she turned into a pillar of salt. But this is, this is so important because what do you think when, when all of a sudden his wife turns into a pillar of salt and he looks at his wife and he sees the burning embers of Sodom and he thinks about his friends there. But more importantly, he thinks about his married daughters and son-in-laws that they couldn't get out. And he's thinking about his grandchildren, if he had any. Scripture is not clear on that. But can you imagine what he's thinking about? That I took them there. I took them there as head of the family. See, when you're a daddy, when you're a head of a family, you've got to consider the impact of your decisions and your moves on your children. There are people who, who are, are, take their, their families and move them for mammon. You know, take them out of a good church where they're growing up and they're, they're hearing the voice of God and move to another city because, hey, I'm getting more money. See, parents have a responsibility. You just can't, at a whim, do certain things. Remember Lot. Remember what Lot did. And we don't know if he felt remorse. We don't know. We would assume that he did. Because then what did he do? He got drunk and, you know, bad, bad ending over there. But, but think about this. Would he have thought, I took them there and now they're all gone. And my wife is this pillar of stone. This is also a picture of what's gonna happen at the end. Do you understand? It's a picture of what's gonna happen at the end because God is going to protect the righteous. Doesn't the word say, I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor their seed begging bread. God's gonna take care of us. God's gonna take care of us regardless of what's going on outside of our little bubble here in Hobbs, regardless of what's going on, God's gonna take care of us. And then at the last minute, He's going to deliver us because we are righteous. And notice that, that Lot wasn't perfect, but God delivered him. And at the last minute, God's gonna deliver us and the rest are gonna burn. You understand that your church involvement, you're growing in the things of God, you're learning this word, you're putting into practice in your life is the most important thing that you can ever do. The most important. And parents, as parents, you have a responsibility to train your children. What does that mean? Not only to bring them to church, but as, as Pastor Charity said last night in deep, be the example at the house. Be the example at the house. Because kids know if their parents are two-faced, if their parents are hypocrites, because they're hearing the same thing in their classes. 
You see, parents have a lot of responsibility and you will be held accountable for what you do with your family. So then in Matthew 5, 14, it says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. You're the light of the world. See, the world has no other light, but Christians, we are the light, do you understand? There's no other source of light that the world has. The world is totally dependent on us. You know, Jesus said in John 9, 5, I'm the light of the world. Well, listen, now that you're born again, that you're a child of God, the Spirit of God is on the inside of you. The light of Jesus is on the inside of you. And just like the song was playing before, let your light shine. Let your light shine. So let's look at some history behind the statement that Jesus made about the light and a city set upon a hill. How did Jesus know this? Why did he refer to a city set upon a hill? We don't have any hills around here. But, but let me tell you, Nazareth was three miles from Sephoris. Nazareth was three miles from Sephoris and Sephoris is, is in ruins now, but Sephoris was a city that was on the hill. Do you understand? And so Jesus lived in that small little town but then Herod Antipas, who was in charge, he wanted this city of Sephoris to be his uh, seat of administrative uh, headquarters. And so what he did is he sent a lot, spent a lot of money making this a great, great, great city. Do you understand? It was the center of trade and commerce. It was fabulous. It was a very, very wealthy city. And it attracted visitors from all over the world. There were people there from every culture, every ethnicity. They all spoke different languages. It was a thriving metropolis. They even had a, a, a huge theater. So it was a booming city. So you, so you can understand, get the picture. He's down there in his little town and he looks up and he sees the lights of the big city. Now, Many of the workers that were, were, were um, engaged to work on building this city came from Nazareth. And so, um, the, you know, the Bible says that Joseph was a carpenter and we think carpenter, wood, carpentry, no. In the Greek, it doesn't mean that. This is what it means. It describes a highly skilled craftsman who works in stone or could be a construction supervisor. And so there wouldn't have been a position right, like that probably in, in Nazareth. So Joseph went the three miles and he worked in Sephora. Now, let me tell you, in those days, you took your son to work. You took your son to work. So Jesus went there quite often and, and they had the greatest mosaics. In other words, you can still go there today and see these mosaics that were made of stone. They're still there today, beautiful mosaics. So it's probable that maybe Joseph worked on this kind of stuff. So you can imagine because it was a city set on a hill, he could see the lights at night. And that's what he's referring to. That's why he speaks about that. So this, this city and going in there had a great influence because how did Jesus know about rich men? How did he know about the various things that he talked about if he had not been involved in that kind of thing? He had seen that kind of thing. And so um, in verse 16, it says, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. You see, he saw the light. He saw the light there. That's the way we are to be as a city set up on a hill. That city did not go unnoticed. Do you understand? We're to be the light. We're to be the light. Why? Let it shine before men. See, it's not all about you. It's not all about me. We have to let our light shine in a dark world. And it's just like a moth to a flame. Do you understand? A moth is drawn to the light and people will be drawn to the light. They will be drawn to the light because they'll wonder, 
Why are you like that? Why are you at peace? Why do you have joy? Why do you still have church when all the other churches are shut down? Why do you do this? Why do you not do this? Why do you not go to the bars? Why do you not, you, you not lie and cheat and whatever? You know, the world is looking for peace. They're work, looking for the light. They're looking for somebody to be the salt in their life. And Jesus has clearly said in his sermon, you are those. You are the salt, you are the light. You are to be like a city set up on a hill, beaconing forth the truth of the gospel. And I'm so grateful for internet. I'm so grateful for an opportunity that we have to go all over the world basically and tell the good news. But you go into your world and share Jesus. You be the salt, you be the light. See, it says, let your light shine, Jesus said it, before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. People are observing you. They're looking at you. They're noticing the light of Jesus in you if you're letting it shine through you. And how do you let the light of Jesus shine through you? By your actions, right? By what you're doing, by your attitude. You have a stinking attitude. No, you choose to be a reflection of Jesus. You choose to be led by the spirit or your flesh or carnality. And remember, carnality is pointless worthless endeavors. And I pray through all these messages, you have learned that, look, I've got a higher call than to be the best video game player or the best whatever on Facebook, finding out the gossip in the news of everybody else or Pinterest or, or some of these other distractions that the world is using to suck you in so that you are not confident in what Jesus has done for you, that you are the salt, that you are the light, so that when you go out of your place, of your home, you have the attitude of, I can charge hell with a water pistol because I'm strong in the Lord and the power of his might, instead of thinking, oh, I, I, I really won today on that video game. I did good after six hours of playing that or whatever. Do you understand the difference between carnality, which is pointless endeavors, which the world wants to suck you into pointless endeavors that, that add no value to your life and this that will cause you to be victorious and overcomer in this life. See, the way we are the light, the way we are as a city set up on the hill, we put the word of God on the inside of us. We put the word, the lights in Jesus' day, those were those little containers and they had oil. They had oil on the inside. What does oil represent? The Holy Spirit. We are the light, we are that light and that light that oil wouldn't do anything until the fire, until it was lit with the fire. And John the Baptist said of Jesus in Luke 3, 16, he said, he's coming, he's coming and he's gonna baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. It's time for the church of Jesus Christ all over the world to rise up and say, no longer am I gonna be led by carnality. I'm not gonna give in to the distractions of the world. I've got the Holy Spirit on the inside of me. I've got the fire of the Holy Ghost, which the fire will do what? It'll burn out things that shouldn't be there. I've got the fire of the Holy Ghost and I've also got the fire meaning zeal of God consuming me and I'm gonna go forth every single day and do what Jesus commanded me to do which is be the salt and be the light. Amen.